Okay. So um, what I'm going to talk about ties in nicely uh, with what uh, Fabian uh, just said. Before I do that, um, let me just say that uh, talking about the singularity um, is actually really hard uh, or close to impossible without uh, you know, just waving your arms around and getting all excited about uh, the big idea uh, that, you're, that you're talking about there. Uh, and uh, for me, the reason why that is the case um, is similar or you know, is analogous to um, the reason why it's hard to talk about black holes. And uh, the people who first introduced the term uh, technological singularity which is, as, as far as I know, is Werner Winge and um, Ray Kurzweil, they really borrowed this term from relativity where um, you know, the singularity is the black hole. And it has two interesting properties. Uh, first of all, if you're at a safe distance uh, and observing the system, you cannot really exchange information with it. You don't see what's going on there. You don't see beyond the event horizon. You, don't re you really have no way of knowing what's going on in there. Um, so that applies to the technological singularity, I think. And the other one is, um, as you're speeding towards it, um, you don't notice the event horizon. There's no flash of light or an event or nothing. You just go towards this big unknown uh, at increasing speed. Um, and uh, I think with the technological singularity, um, we are pretty much uh, in the same situation. So the question of when is it going to happen, let's you know, give it a date, um, is really pretty much meaningless by, pr by principal reasons, we can't know. So uh, we've also mentioned, Fabian has also mentioned that the pop notion, uh, the, the popular culture notion of the singularity, of technological singularity, which goes like this. There is a team of people, they are very bright. They do some research and development and at some point they make an invention or you know, do something spe specific and then you get this real quick exponential uh, takeoff and uh, this uh, intelligence explosion and usually it's also you know, visually spectacular because the people who are making the pop culture here are out of Hollywood and you know, need uh, spectacular visuals. And I tend to think uh, that this notion of you know, the quick hard takeoff uh, singularity is sort of misleading. Um, but that's fine because it's really hard to talk about and uh, what I'm going to show you now is just an alternative way of looking at the same set of ideas and doesn't necessarily claim to be more true uh, than that. So at the heart of uh, all this, at the heart of the idea of the technological singularity, there is really the idea of positive feedback loops from cybernetics. And um, this works like this. You have a system and there's dynamics in there and you can observe two variables and there's a positive feedback relationship between the two variables. So you notch up the one thing, the other goes up and vice versa. And uh, you know, if you put some activation in there, like, you know, if you increase the number of cattle running, the panic increases, which causes more cattle to run, and eventually the whole herd is panicking. And if you plot either of the variables, you get this nice exponential graph. Or if you're in an actual system, in an, you know, in an ecosystem, or uh, you run out of cattle. So you don't actually get an exponential graph, but more of something like a, like a sigmoid, so it saturates. Um, and the idea uh, when we talk about the technological singularity is really we have the same sort of relationship uh, of, of uh, mutual reinforcement between technology and intelligence. So there's some intelligence that creates more technology, you know, improves on itself, and um, you know, this feedback loop gets kicked off. And now let's go from high school cybernetics to furniture. This is the uh, Neuwieder Kabinett done by a guy called David Röntgen in 1777. Um, it's on display at the Kunstgewerbe Museum here in Berlin. Um, and it is obviously eminently beautiful, but uh, it also does this. And now let's hope um, the video actually plays. Does it move? Yes, it does move. So there is lots of mechanism. This is just one of them uh, in there. Um, and you know, things happen. And then you get this. It's transformer furniture. <laughs> Bang. Okay. So why is this in a, in a museum? Uh, apart from it being very beautiful, um, before David Röntgen, furniture didn't really look like this. He was the first guy who was able to build something like this. And for you know, one of the reasons is he was very talented, and the other reason is he was allowed by special permission um, to employ eighty people, not only three in his workshop. So he really could put together the brains of engineers and artisans 
to make uh, something like that. Why did he need special permission? Because there was, in Rococo times, something called Zunftzwang. So in order to manufacture anything, you needed to be part of a Zunft. And this meant uh, you had to follow a set of rules, one of which was you couldn't employ more than four people. And that leads to the question, why did they do that? Why did pu people put this regulation in place? You know, you have no Zunftzwang, cool transformer furniture. You have Zunftzwang and just desks. So why were they doing this? Were they stupid? Um, and I would say that probably not. Whenever somebody tells you that people in the past were stupider than us, they are probably selling an idea to you that you shouldn't buy. This was a deliberate choice by then. Um, and um, my interpretation was uh, they were doing exactly this. They were preventing the feedback loop between intelligence and capital from being kicked off. This is a deliberate feedback damper that uh, prevented the reinvestment of money uh, that you got for making something really beautiful into more technology. And um, something interesting happened since they did that. If you look at the picture on the right, you see something that looks like a pyramid. And on the bottom, you have people who you know, create food. And then there is, an, uh, there's a, there's a layer of people who provide for security and shelter. And then there's a couple of clerics for the more emotional needs. And then you have a couple of uh, nobles and kings, and they essentially pay the, uh, the, the artists. Uh, and if you look at this and you've studied economics, then this looks a lot uh, like the famous pyramid of needs. So um, in Rococo society, pretty much everyone makes food. In our society, does anybody know the number of or the percentage of people who are still in producing food? Fabian? Okay, so you, you know the number. I, I only know the number for the primary sector, uh, which is 2.1. So absolutely nobody is making food. Um, what happened uh, in that time? My take on this is techno-capital happened. The combination of you know, capitalism and increasing uh, amounts of technology in the system. Now in philosophy, um, they have a concept called deterritorialization by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari. And that is uh, the process of detaching people from all their old context, getting them off their land that has provided sustenance so far, putting people into the cities, um, putting them in contact with ideas, putting them under competitive pressure, um, and make them do amazing things. Um, and another word of for that, uh, you know, it's a positive process in a way, uh, is liberate them from the work they uh, had to do. And it's important to know that, uh, you know, this puts a lot of stress on people. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's, there is, um, there's nostalgia for times before, for merry old England when the grass was green and when the hay smelled sweeter and all that. Um, and nobody is really doing deterritorialization. Nobody's responsible for it. You know, it's not the Jews like the Nazis would have you that are doing all this capitalism thing, or it's not the bourgeoisie or the, cap the, the capitalists like the Soviets would have you. This is something that happens, like traffic. Nobody does this. This just happens to us. It's a thing on its own. It's a, an abstract dynamic. There's a couple of names for that. Um, you, know, you can call it, if you want to be very fancy, deterritorialization. And you can also just call it modernization or rationalization. Uh, I like to call it capital or techno-capital. It's really the same thing. Um, and why does it happen? Fabian says because we're lazy. I think it goes deeper. Uh, it caters to our needs, and that's all of them. It includes um, you know, the real monkey brain stuff. So uh, if you ask the question, why does it happen? Uh, what drives it? I think this question is actually equivalent to the question, uh, why do we buy fancier cars or why do we buy fancier smartphones? Yeah, they're useful, but we're doing other things with them. You know, we, we, we transport, uh, we signal status, uh, we attract mates, we do all this, uh, this sort of thing. So the monkey brain um, is really what fuels all this high-tech stuff uh, that we're doing in the end. Okay, so one point, what was it? Two percent of people are in food. What is everybody doing? Um, some of us have become hairdressers, uh, most of us have not. Um, in 2014, 40% of the American workforce was white collar jobs. And uh, white collar jobs, what, they what do they do? They manage complexity. That's really what it's about. They manage complexity 
and the automation that we have in place for uh, have put in place for uh, producing things. And managing complexity and managing the automation is actually a very good description of what intelligence itself is. Uh, that's that's what intelligence is for. So what techno capital does in this big sweeping process, 300 years process of deterritorialization, is it extracts intelligence from the land. That's the rare resource, you know, make people use their brains. That's what's going on. Capital drives people into the cities to use their brains. Which is where intelligence automation comes in. So, um, some of this can be automated, and Fabian has you know, named the topical examples of uh, intelligence that has been automated, like making calculations, storing and retrieving information, driving cars, playing chess, playing Go, winning a Jeopardy, you name it. So all of this is happening, and if you ask the question, uh, this, this process is probably going to continue, and if you ask the question, which jobs will be replaced? Um, my answer would be pretty much anything that you can automate will be automated. AIs are cheaper, they're more reliable, they scale really well. Um, and you are in a situation where uh, you know, they're also, I mean, they're just less whiny. You know, people go on strike and uh, this sort of thing, and AIs never do that. Okay, so now that this is happening, what's the singularity going to be like? And my take would be, I don't really know, but I would be surprised if it would be the hard takeoff scenario. Uh, that's not you know, how anything in this continuing evolution that we have seen ever happened. It's not what you get. What's going on right now is that there are many teams across the planet. They're all smart, they're all making inventions, and none of these inventions is you know, producing the hard takeoff. That's why having a system on Google that uh, you know, answers emails is not kicking off uh, the hard takeoff singularity. So what we're rather going to get, that would be my take, is an accelerating, an accelerating evolution of intelligences that compete with each other. Sounds like good news for the, the humans, whoever that is. Um, I don't think it is. We will be less and less relevant uh, in that scenario because accelerating means that you know, they, will you know, they, evo they will evolve faster than we can even understand what's going on between the intelligence automation systems. Okay, so to conclude, I don't think anybody has any reasonable clue as to how close we are to the singularity or when it will happen. It, it, to me, the, the question is, is almost meaningless. You know, it's a, it's a process that is going on, and it's been going on for centuries uh, that, that we're in. And um, what we do know is the feedback dampers have been long removed. You know, that, that, that's not just sort of trying, it's a lot of things, like the ban on capital, uh, on, 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 on credit. Lots of things that were in place to prevent exactly the world that we're now living in have been removed, and it has been kicked off. So it's happening. Um, and you know, various attempts that have been made in history to stop it um, ended with us killing each other big time, but nothing else happened. Um, the reason we're talking about the singularity now is probably not um, that you know, we feel it approaching or we have any informed guess uh, that it will approach soon, but just there were major breakthroughs in machine learning three years ago, which triggered a lot of science fiction, which you know, triggers the interest that we now all have uh, in the topic. So it's it's a bit fashionable right now, right? The other thing that you can take away from this perspective is optimizing for intelligence, whatever you do, is probably the right thing to do. So whatever you do, ask yourselves, are you optimizing for intelligence in that process? Because if you do that, you're pretty much aligned with history. And the real takeaway is intelligence is not, uh, artificial intelligence or intelligence automation is not a technology or an invention like Wi-Fi or rockets or computers. It's uh, more like the ultimate mega trend, the thing that capital wants to do, right? It's the telos of techno capital in a way. Okay, and I'm going to conclude by reading um, the first paragraph of a piece by a philosopher called Nick Land, who worked at the University of Warwick in the 1990s. Um, and he certainly wasn't to note the first to uh, notice the, you know, this dynamic and this reading of history but he was certainly the best writer amongst those uh, who did. 
the story goes like this. Earth is captured by a techno-capital singularity as Renaissance rationalization and oceanic navigation lock into commoditization takeoff. Logistically accelerating techno-economic interactivity crumbles social order in auto-sophisticating machine runaway. As markets learn to manufacture intelligence, politics modernizes, upgrades paranoia, and tries to get a grip. The body count climbs through a series of globe wars. Emergent planetary commercium trashes the Holy Roman Empire, the Napoleonic continental system, the Second and Third Reich, and the Soviet International, cranking up world disorder through compressing phases. Deregulation and the state arms race each other into cyberspace. By the time soft engineering slithers out of his box into yours, human security is lurching into crisis. Cloning, lateral genodata transfer, transversal replication and cyberotics flood in amongst the relapse onto bacterial sex. Neo-China arrives from the future. Hypersynthetic drugs click into digital voodoo. Retro disease, nanospasm, beyond the judgment of God, meltdown. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I tend to think that the self-awareness is a different thing. So that's a separate system you buy, uh, you, you, you build for very specific reasons. You don't need a system that's self-aware to rule you, right? That's the other thing is the transfer, um, the, you know, the, the de siloization if you, if, you, if you so want. We need ideas there. I think there are a couple out there. I mean, there are people who aren't just doing machine learning, but are trying to integrate machine learning into systems that can do real artificial general intelligence. My group happens to be one of them. Uh, I'm not claiming we got it right or will get it right. But uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an active field of research and um, it's ongoing. We're not quite there yet and it's really hard. So you know, we do simpler stuff for money and do this for uh, you know, just knowing where we go, aligning with the trends here. My guess is five to 10 years uh, before um, you get machine learning that actual, actually produces representations that can be used in different contexts, because that's what you're, what you're really asking about. Yeah. yeah, okay, so the question was, how can we get the data out of the data silos that we have created with the big process of centralization that we have let happen in the last 10 years uh, on the web? So we would own our data, and we would own you know, what the AIs do uh, with the data. Um, I don't have answers. Um, but I agree it's a very important problem. Um, you know, there are technologies out there that decentralize, uh, that trying to re-decentralize the web. I happen to be a fan of Orbit. I don't know if you've uh, seen that one. Um, so there are ideas, but you know, these are nerd ideas and you need to get the people who are on Facebook to follow, otherwise you will end up being in diaspora where famously lots of nerds were and nobody else. Um, so. Whether that happens or not is, uh, you know, up to different uh, up to different people. I don't I don't know. I, I mean, I agree. It's super urgent.